Easter. You probably won't remember it because you don't pay much attention to me anyway. <laughs> Just kidding. That was my joke right there. Turn the light on. Say amen. <laughs> yeah, turn the light on. <laughs> See, visitors, why I have this song, this light here, because these people would make me beg for amens. I'd have to go like this, you know. So I was threatening to make a sign, which I, I have a woodshop. I could do that and push a button and light up amen. So they went and found one and bought it for me, and I just pushed the button. And so I get amens that way instead of begging for them. This happened on Resurrection Sunday. It happened on Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago. Jesus suffered and died on what we call Good Friday. It wasn't so good for him, but it was good for us. Yes. And in Luke 24, 32, it says, They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Would you bow your heads? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to bring this word, these morsels from your precious word to the family in the house today. And we pray that these words will be guided by your Holy Spirit into our hearts. You will direct them where, they, where you want them to go and they will cause the effect that you want them to have. We ask for that in Jesus' name. Only the Gospel of Luke contains this event that happened on the resurrection day of our Lord. It's in, it's in Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and starting with verse 13, it says, Now, that same day, that being Easter Sunday morning, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Remember, this is seven miles away. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. In other words, how it was that Jesus was arrested, etc., etc., crucified, laid in the grave. In other words, they, they were talking about all this stuff. They were his disciples, two of them. So we pick it up in verse 15 of Luke 24, where it says, As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. I think in the King James it says they were sad. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Jesus said, What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they, re Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who, had, who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had, had, uh, women had said, but they did not see Jesus. That was Peter and John, by the way. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are. Now this is a hinge. Something happens right in between here. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer? He could have referred right there to Isaiah 53, which Jennifer read for us, when it describes him as a suffering savior. Suffer these things and then enter his glory. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us. For it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to in to stay with them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? The title for this sermon is Gospel Heartburn, and that's where that term comes from. Verse 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Cleopas and his friend, we don't know who the friend was, were downcast. You might be feeling downcast because of things happening in your life or in your family. There's a lot of things that cause us to feel downcast. That just happens in life. I mean, it, it just happens. Jesus came along. Jesus, he's always there, but he reveals his presence in times of our greatest need. He reveals himself. In times of despair, times when we wonder, where is Jesus when we need him? We all have those kind of hard times. The IRS is coming. The sheriff is coming. The bank's coming to take my house. My daughter ran away and joined the circus. The roof leaks. The hen quit laying. The cow dried up. The well went dry. <laughs> There's too much month left at the end of my money. So now what? We all have now what times in our life. Amen? Amen? I should have pushed the button right. We all have now what times. Now what are we going to do? He prodded them to reveal their heart of concern. He knew what their heart was, but he wanted them to tell him. And sometimes we keep our concerns all wrapped up inside of us, and we don't tell them. Just tell it to, that's a song, tell it to Jesus. We should sing that sometime. Jesus wants us to tell him what's bothering us. Is there anybody in here that doesn't have any bothers? I doubt it. Maybe Magnolia. <laughs> they were bewildered. They didn't know what to believe or what to think. They were in a now what time. They were discomforted and they were out of their comfort zone. They left. They headed for home. They saw their Savior crucified. They saw him laid in a tomb. So they left. They retreated. They were like lost sheep separated from the flock. See, the rest of them were still there. They're trying to find comfort somewhere else because of the things that happened. They might have thought maybe they would be next. They knew what happened in Jerusalem, but they didn't know what's going to happen now, so they left. And Jesus, being the shepherd, came after them. He always comes after the lost sheep. They left a flock based on what they saw with their eyes instead of what their hearts should have told them. These two were disciples, and Jesus had told them to wait. But they got their own idea. They followed their own inclination. They followed their own heart. They followed their own wisdom, and they didn't wait. Luke 24, 49, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high, which happened in Acts chapter 2. And 
that's what he that's was the instructions and the rest of them followed they were together but these two were lost sheep they got their own idea and they left we make decisions on our own power on our own wisdom and a lot of times it's a big mistake you ever made a mistake I made several today already <laughs> I told you before, my wife always checks me at the door to see if I'm zipped up and if I have my teeth in. Well, I had my teeth in. <laughs> we make decisions, you know, based on our own wisdom, and our wisdom is flawed. Because it's based on what's best for us and not how it best pleases God. The Proverbs chapter 8 wisdom of God is available to us. There's a higher form of wisdom. There's three places. It says in Proverbs chapter 8, first three verses, Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice at the highest point along the way? Where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance, she cries aloud. Those are places of decision. Those are places at the highest point along the way when you're not there yet. It's a high point. You're trying to see ahead where the paths meet. Those are intersections in life. Should I go this way or that way? And beside the gates leading into the city, those are times when you have to choose whether you're going to be in an entanglement with some other person or people. And Proverbs 8 says that farther down in the 20s of that, of that chapter, it says that that's, that's God's wisdom. So after the encounter with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, God's wisdom kicked in. They were on the road to Emmaus because that's what they thought they should do. Something profound happened. A change took place. They turned around. Remember, how many miles was it? Seven. Seven miles. What time of day was it? It was late in the day. They turned around and walked seven miles back into the city. I think the buses had already quit running. <laughs> they overcame their comfort zone problem because of Jesus' words. If you lie on Jesus' words in the Bible, that'll help you get out of your comfort zone. They went back to where the action was. Even though they went back into the city, they were actually going forward in God. Jesus used the word to set their hearts on fire. Set their hearts on fire. It said, did not our hearts burn within us? Because of the heart-burning experience with Jesus. Have you ever been there? They turned around. Sometimes he has to turn us around. A lot of times he has to turn us around. We get off on our own tangent. These two were probably there in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. Because they went back. They probably had tongues of fire on their heads. Because they went back. They got back into the fold. They were probably among those who were sent out into the streets and were heard by the multitude speaking in tongues. Because they went back. Got in their own. Got out of their own comfort zone and tangent and went back. They probably heard Paul's sermon and saw 3,000 people come to Christ. And they were baptized that day. And they probably helped to do the baptizing. 3,000 people. Cleopas and his friend had been going their own way based on their own decisions and they were based on fear. Now what? They were stray, lost sheep and Jesus went out to find them. We've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> we'll probably get there again sometime. But now because Jesus used the word, which is his word, he owns the word, to illuminate their way, their life would be different from now on. 
We're all on a path. We're on a roadway in life. They were on a wrong one. They were going the wrong way. They turned around. Because of scriptural heartburn, Jesus answered them with scriptures. The news of the gospel is too good to keep to ourselves. How about Jeremiah? He said in 20 and verse 9, he said, But if I say I will not mention this, or mention his word, or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. So what you do do about gospel heartburn? What did they do? They turned around. Sometimes you need to change direction, to change course. Isaiah 30 and 21 says, Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice saying behind you, This is the way. Walk in it. The still small voice, God speaking to you by His Spirit in a still small voice, will guide you. Yes instead of your own ideas and inclinations. Number two, make a decision based on God's revealed wisdom. He reveals it in His Word. Number three, make sure you're on, make sure that your life's pathway is illuminated by the light of God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 105, your Word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. Watch out. For what God is calling you to do. If you if you open your if you open yourself, open your spirit to what God is calling, He will call you. And and you don't need to say, but Lord, I'm not I can't do that. I'm not prepared to do that. I can't. I would have never been a minister. Wouldn't have happened because I, I never felt adequate to do that. What God calls you to do, you say yes to Him, and he pre then He'll prepare you to do it. <laughs> Number five, share the word. Cleopas and his friend had to return to the city. They had to. They were out of God's will when they were in their comfort zone. They had to go back. Jeremiah had to speak the word. It was like a fire in his bones. He couldn't hold it in. What keeps us from doing that? Comfort zoneitis. <laughs> we don't feel comfortable enough to do that. Do it anyway. <laughs> We have to be willing to do what makes no sense. If we, try to, if we try to conform what God wants us to do into our own sense, our own sense, instead of what makes... It, we try to conform God's move into our sense. God doesn't have to conform to us. It's the other way around. Amen? Amen. It's the other way around. We're all ministers of the Word. God gave some to be pastors and teachers. It says to prepare the saints for works of service. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The pastor is supposed to prepare the saints. I'm supposed to prepare you guys by preaching and teaching to do the work. Because I don't live where you live. I don't work where you work. I don't go to school where you go to school. You are out there in the community and you have to be willing to carry that news, that good news, the gospel, to wherever you are. Even it's out of your comfort zone. We're called for a purpose. Maybe you never felt called Maybe just not listening to the still small voice that speaks to you in the quiet of your spirit. This church was established for a purpose. 
God, use God's wisdom instead of your own desires. Would you let Jesus set your heart on fire? Would you do that? Not later on, but today, would you do that? Let Jesus set your heart on fire like he did on us, with those guys? Would you be willing as an individual and as a church to get out of your comfort zone and to do new things that God may be leading you into? All you have to do, stay in the Word, listen to the still small voice, and go do it. That sounds simple, doesn't it? Until we're all bound up in our comfort zone-itis. <laughs> the cure for that comfort zone-itis is just to get out there and do it. See, I leave a pause for an amen, but I, but you know, I don't. I have to push buttons. <laughs> Would you stand? I'm going to turn you loose pretty soon. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after March 21st. I don't know why. Others, other holidays are on a certain day, December 25th, you know. I don't know why, how that came about. I don't have any idea. No idea. But it is. And so, it's a celebration. What they did to Jesus was tragic and, and hideous and ugly and disgusting. And he didn't have to do it. He could have called 12 legions of angels yes. to destroy this world and set him free. Yes. But God so loved the world. You can put your own name in there. Yes. God so loved you, put your own name in there, that he gave his only begotten son. That, put your own name in there, should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved us so much that he did that. He became sin. Our sin. He took all the sins of the world upon him on that cross. God turned away. Why have you forsaken me? God turned away. The Father turned away. At that moment. And Jesus hung between the earth and between heaven. And he won. Because he came out of the cross. I mean, out of the grave. He came out of that tomb. He won. Yes. And he shares that victory with us. Amen. We win Hallelujah. when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. We win. Amen. We win. Yes. It's not us, not anything we're doing. We win because he puts it on us, his win. Amen. All we have to do is say yes, Lord, yes to Jesus. That's all we have to do. I've led a lot of people to the Lord. Over all my time, since 1973 as a believer, believe that? I got, I got saved in the 73rd year of the previous century. <laughs> and I've led people on the phone, I've led them on the street. It's just something I, once you start doing that, you get addicted to it. But if there's anyone here that has never accepted Jesus as Lord and made him the savior, and, uh, and the Lord of your life. This would be a good time for you to do that and start on the road, on the right road, and in, back into the fold, back to the fold of Jesus. You know, it says the broad is the way that leads to destruction, and everybody starts on that way. And some of us come to an intersection in life where the cross is and turn off and go the narrow way that leads to eternal life. You might be standing at that crossroads right now. If you are, you're in the midst of people that love you and would like to lead you to the Lord. And if that might be you, if someone in the house today, come on down. Just come on down. There's nobody here but us. <laughs> There's nobody here but us. So if that's you, step out of your place and just come down here and we will rejoice with you and lead you to the Lord. Anybody? I'm going to wait just a second. Okay, Jesus, our friend, you have called us a friend, and that's so powerful.
that a friend would die for us. And we thank you, Lord, on this Resurrection Sunday for what you did 2,000 years ago. And what you continue to do, what you keep doing, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for every believer in here. We thank you for the households that represent. And uh, we just thank you for the word and the power it has in our lives. And we just ask you to be with each one until next time we meet. As we go our separate ways, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.